Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session, Three Cloud Security Surprises in 2022. I'm Chris, and I'll be your coordinator. We're happy to have you join us. Before we get started, there's just a couple items to cover. All attendees are in listen-only mode. This webinar is being recorded. Please share your questions you might have, and we'll try to answer those at the end. For our speakers today, we have special guests from AWS, Clark Rogers. Clark brings his AWS migration experience and more than 20 years in security, risk, and compliance roles to guide enterprise customers and their cloud transformation journeys. As an AWS enterprise security strategist, Clark is passionate about helping executives explore how the cloud can transform security and working with them to find the right enterprise solutions. And from Clumio, Glenn Mulvaney joins us. Glenn is an experienced technology leader more than 20 years with Bay Area startups in both consumer and enterprise software markets. He leads Clumio's infrastructure security, or excuse me, he leads Clumio's information security and compliance programs. Welcome to both of you and thanks for joining us. Our first cloud security surprise of 2022 is, public cloud is improving organizations, business continuity, response, and recovery. Glenn, would you like to get us started? Yeah, Chris, absolutely. I'm uh, very happy to be here today. Um, yeah, this had occurred to me and I was thinking about how um, DR and BC has kind of changed a lot recently and especially with public cloud. And I think it's definitely changed for the better. So what I notice now is it's certainly a lot easier for organizations in the public cloud in many ways to perform BR testing, to keep their BC plans up to date, uh, to uh, actually do their simulations and tabletops using public cloud in a way that was really difficult before. You would have to have a lot of infrastructure, you'd have to have a lot of procedures and resources to keep that infrastructure in sync. But you know, when I look at how we perform our own DR and how my colleagues in the industry uh, perform their DR exercises, it seems like it's a lot more frequent now. It seems like it's a lot easier to go forward with the, the, the tools and the infrastructure that public cloud provide to really have a very robust and up-to-date um, business continuity and DR plan. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, that that fundamentally, I think, is, is a bit of a surprise to me is that, um, you know, public cloud brings a huge amount of benefits, but boy, like uh, the, the ability to uh, have recovery be, you know, so advanced and so much more efficient than it was in the past um, kind of surprised me. And, and that that's something that I, I think really resonates a lot. Uh, lately, especially with the prevalence of, of ransomware attacks and a lot of times for uh, a ransomware incident to really be resolved for an organization, you need to, to recover and, and go forward and engage your, um, your DR plans. So uh, that, that's, that's something that I, I was thinking about recently and, and uh, it, it, it does surprise me and, and it, it, it does make me feel that, um, uh, you know, public cloud has really change that landscape for me. Yeah, Glenn, I, 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 th I think you're spot on there. The, um, for, for the customers that have spent the time uh, to invest in public cloud and all the uh, subsequent training that goes along with, you know, building out infrastructure as code and being able to test uh, infrastructure launches via pipeline, uh, you know, we don't want anybody to uh, suffer from a ransomware event, but if if you were to suffer from one in the cloud, it is much simpler, again, assuming you've done all the uh, requisite uh, pre-steps and the pre-work, uh, to recover from something like that. We have, you know, the, the whole gamut of customers that, you know, on, on the one end, you know, they're working in the AWS console and they can spin up resources very, very quickly and then maybe uh, uh, use their backups to actually recover uh, from a ransomware event in, in, in one sense or any other DRBC event. Uh, and then on the complete other side, the most advanced customers are, you know, rehydrating their environments via code and automation as, as frequently as every couple of days, which, which is pretty amazing. And when you think about the the business impact of that, right? So when you can go uh, to your business leadership and say, I can recover the entire environment in a couple of days or a couple of hours, maybe if it's a particular production workload, something like that. And it's 
effectively a non-event at that time uh, is, is pretty, pretty powerful. And then it's, it's a business enabler, if nothing else, because yes, we can continue to move fast and release products and services to uh, delight our own customers and be prepared for, for bad things that, that happen in the night, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. There's something that you said uh, on this subject uh, in a previous conversation, Clark, and I, I, I think you had mentioned that uh, there's a philosophy of uh, crawling and walking and then running and sprinting. And uh, I think especially for uh, things that are complex like BC and DR plans, um, that's really important to organizations, especially, you know, maybe you're a new org and in year one, it's your first year in public cloud. Um, you might be crawling and walking, but you've got everything that you need to kind of go to that sophisticated place that you mentioned where you're rehydrating your production data every three days. And uh, that to me is, is just, it's transformative and, and uh, uh, it's, it's definitely changes the, the, the what, IT teams will face and what security teams will face when uh, they end up having an event. If you have practiced these tabletop exercises and practice these simulations and you know those plans are up to date, um, things go a heck of a lot smoother. Um, but I, I love the idea that uh, that you mentioned that like you want to get to that level of sophistication that you're just you're prepared and ready to go anytime and you make it as much of a nine event as possible. Yeah. And and those and those BC plans. Well, yes, you want to have a, a human readable copy somewhere, but those plans could have, could have, you know could uh, literally be a uh, pull request from a Git repository, right? Which you know just get getting your mind around that is completely different, especially if you've been doing uh, BC and DR for you know 20, 25 years. You know it's no long it's no longer call up the backup company and say send me the tapes, right? Right. It's kick off that script and just watch the magic happen. Yeah, absolutely. Just an automated workflow, and uh, and that is something I think every everyone wants to wants to to reach and get towards. Uh, but the incremental steps along the way uh, are are incredibly important as well. But uh, the the path is so much shorter now. I I, I think it's uh, um, uh, truly remarkable that that's that's where we are in 2022. All right, thanks so much. The second surprise that we came up with here, robust security services are native and more readily available. Clark, would you like to get started with this one? Certainly. Um, to sort of preface this, I, I, I think, you know, sharing what I, when I meet with uh, CISOs from, you know, virtually every industry that AWS does business with, I'm seeing a, a very positive trend that these CISOs are focusing on security outcomes over security tooling, right? Now, you may need security tooling and security products to achieve those security outcomes, but they're really, really focusing on um, the outcome in such a sense, you know, maybe I need encryption or I may need to block this type of traffic on a firewall, whatever the case may be first, right? And they outline that very, very clearly about what my security outcomes are. Then they start looking at, well, how do I achieve these outcomes? It might be a people, process, organizational change and no technology involved at all, right? And then the next step may be, okay, maybe I need a piece of technology to help, help with this. It used to be only uh, third-party tools were able to help with this. But as public cloud has evolved, there's a lot of native security services that are available that customers can take advantage of as well as, especially with something like AWS Marketplace, to be able to use uh, tools from trusted partners that you have uh, used uh, for years, right? And your, your staff is trained up on them, they know how to use the console, they know the benefits, et cetera. What I see is a, as a trend over time, and again, if we use that crawl, walk, run, sprint metaphor, uh, as customers start off in the cloud, they more than likely are bringing a lot of the security tools that they had in the past because of that comfort level, right? Cloud is new. Maybe I've not developed a capability around infrastructure or security as code yet using native services, but I am I know what I need to achieve, right? So I, I know that security outcome, so may I, I may bring that uh, third-party security product in. But over time, as security teams and infrastructure teams and development teams all start working together, 
in uh, the public cloud, they then can see the capability that's out there. So if we look at AWS, for example, I believe, uh, depending on, on when you see this, on our website, we have 25 to 30 security services that are branded as security services. And you may need to take one or more of those plus a third party product to actually achieve whatever your security outcome is. But as customers get more mature and they start using more and more of the services, they realize that some non-security services within AWS can actually achieve security outcomes, which is pretty cool. And then you start thinking about, well, if I can code the use of a couple of AWS services to achieve a security outcome, I may or may not need that third party product anymore, right? Because oftentimes we have customers who are using uh, third party tools that they're paying a lot of money for a lot of features that they don't use and they're only using a subset of those features. As you build in more automation and you really are focusing on that security outcome, perhaps you can tie together a couple of native services and achieve that same security outcome for your business. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I couldn't have said anything uh, uh, better or more authoritative than that, uh, Clark. I, I think that the things that stand out to me, especially in the native services, and you mentioned this, is that there's just a vast number of them now, uh, and they have grown uh, over time uh, due to customer need and customer demand. And uh, just the the fact that the landscape is right there in front of you in in public cloud with all of these services ready to go. And maybe like you said, the familiarity isn't there. I, I may have worked with a trusted vendor for the past decade or, or uh, longer, and I can still bring them in through uh, a third party mechanism through like, yeah. uh, like the marketplace. But the, the, the native services many times um, can be more cost effective. Um, they have familiar APIs that are similar to the other APIs in, in the cloud provider. And, uh, you know, it's certainly you can get um, with a bit of, of uh, coding and, and uh, engineering and, and staff resources, but it, the, the amount is not a, a huge burden uh, in my opinion. And I think, I think that that, um, it, it certainly makes me recommend public cloud a lot more strongly knowing that that native security is there. And then you've got this entire ecosystem of third party also supporting public cloud um, security. But I think that, um, Perhaps a criticism that I remember from uh, the earlier days of public cloud was that, you know, security was always a concern. And I, I think very much now um, the public cloud is on the forefront and that in the end of it's, it's, it's obvious in the, in the services available there, the innovation for security is, is vibrant and it's still growing. And uh, I, I really think that that's uh, uh, something I, I it especially resonates in, in, in uh, the last couple of years where we, we see a lot more um, attacks and a lot more scrutiny on uh, what uh, processes are in place to protect infrastructure and protect data. So. Yeah, the, uh, to, to, to underscore that, I cannot remember the last conversation I've had with a customer where they were concerned about the security of the cloud. Their concern was how, to, how do I build my security program to take advantage of the cloud, which is a completely different conversation from 10 years ago, right? Now it's help me move faster, teach me how to do it, which services do I put together to achieve a service uh, to security outcome? And that's that's night and day different from, from what we dealt with, uh, you know, not too long ago, really. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, very much a uh, uh, strong agreement there. And, and I think that, uh, um, Certainly, the the I know I know Amazon talks about the shared responsibility quite a bit. That is still the core of the understanding there on the customer side, and I think I think that is uh, very much um, uh, helped along uh, with with this vast availability of of native security services. Now, it's it's not that you have to go hire a subject matter expert for it. It's it's there in the documentation. It's there in the uh, in, in the service list. So. Thanks so much. And the third and final surprise that we had, unprecedented levels of insights into actions, details, and changes happening within the cloud. Glenn, would you like to take this one? Yeah, Chris, sure, I'll start off. I think um, what 
how I thought about when I read this uh, surprise was how things were done again not too long ago, and still in, in a lot of um, uh, in a lot of industries are still done this way. Um, keeping your uh, inventory logs uh, when when your infrastructure changes, uh, if servers or racks or anything is changing, um, having an audit trail of who did what when. That used to uh, involve potentially coordinating and syncing a lot of different sources of data. They could be from different geographical locations. They could be from different software suites. Um, uh, it could be a, a non-trivial thing to, to gather that information and make sure it's authoritative. Um, and it's something that maybe now I think I've been taking for granted in, in um, uh, public cloud you've got an authoritative inventory of every single asset that's in your cloud environment. And you've got an authoritative audit trail of every single action that you would possibly want, all in uh, natively in, in the service. And I, I think this eliminates so much of that um, burden of having to you know, maybe gather all of that information from different software, from different data sources, through different locations. Um, now I can take that, I could put it in a data lake, I can analyze it, I can have almost real-time analysis of what's going on. So from a security operations standpoint, that is truly transformative. And that's something that um, to achieve that um, in, in a non-public cloud kind of world could be an enormous investment in, in dollars and people and resources and time. And this is something that's just kind of part and parcel to what public cloud brings to a security team. And uh, I think, you know, again, I think maybe many of us who have worked in public cloud for a few years have, have taken it for granted, but um, it's, you know, uh, something that it just, it, it just becomes transformative in terms of how much, how much it actually frees up your resources to work on what's important. Um, and doing things like making sure that your audit trail and your, your inventory are secured and immutable and maybe, you know, sent to a separate site so that they can't be uh, uh, attacked or, or, or manipulated by, uh, by an insider or an attacker. That's all there. It's just, it's just given to us right now in the way public cloud is, is available. So um, uh, that's that's something that I think is maybe a latent surprise. It's maybe one that isn't terribly obvious. Well, Glenn, I want to <clears throat> want to take one thing you said about freeing up resources, right? Um, when we think about the the business impact of uh, the people on your security team and what they're doing day in and day out, right? So you covered a lot of well, the security blocking and tackling is a lot easier, right, than 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 it was in the past. But if you think uh, beyond that, right, you want to get the most bang for your buck out of your security resources, IT resources, everything else in the organization. And what's really exciting about the public cloud and what some security teams are doing is they're taking a lot of that blocking and tackling. They're taking a lot of the more um, routine, known bad things that we don't want to have happen and automate them, right? So you can stitch together something like uh, you know guard duty and lambda let's make the assumption that the customer does not want bitcoin mining in their environment right so we don't want this to happen if guard duty finds it fire off lambda to shut down the instances that are running bitcoin and then fire up clean ones so the business keeps running right things like that i i, I see customers investing in engineering and automation to get rid of that low hanging fruit of security that we all agree should not be happening in the environment, automating it takes a lot off the plate of the security team. So then they can actually lean in and uh, offer their services of basically of managing risk for the organization, which is what you're hiring them to do. After you've patched a few machines in your career, you know how to do it, right? So why not automate that and make sure that the system is working for you? And then you can add value back to the business. So the long, you know, the long and the short of that story is that security teams are now enabling the business to move faster, right? So security teams, uh, in some cases, own the pipeline at 
at some organizations, right? So as a security owner, I own your pipeline, right? All my security checks that I care about are built in there. You, Glenn, don't have to manage that pipeline anymore. As a developer, you can now just focus on the code that you need to get out the door to delight your customers, right? So we see businesses moving faster, reacting to their customer needs, reacting to, um, you know, uh, changes in the in their line of business from competitors or whatever the case may be, and security is supporting that, right? It's security is no longer a we have to have that and we hate those people because they're stopping our innovation. It's give me more security because I can actually move faster. Yeah, I think I I, I see that as uh, the teams from becoming or from being reactive to being proactive and like you said where they're now a form of enablement and yeah. and uh, a, a gate rather than uh, a, a, a you know a, a block somewhere or, or just a complete roadblock uh and and that is that is very true and and again if you're if you're not in that and the, the term is is uh, that you used is exactly correct the blocking and tackling that's the very reactive mode the very traditional what's the next problem what's the next fire and then with this this landscape of uh, solutions that we have available to us now, it does let those teams become much more reactive. And and I do I I, I love that um, philosophy of having the uh, the security be be owners of the pipeline and enablers of the pipeline. Uh, that is uh, uh, again something that you know building outside of public cloud is doable. But boy boy would that be a a lot to bite off. And and it's 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 so much more efficient now and so much easier to transform those uh you know maybe as you said traditional kind of cost centers and traditional groups right. that are looked at as for potential uh um uh, potential groups that would stop progress or maybe uh, you know put put roadblocks up in front of actually launching that fancy feature uh but instead they're part of the development they're part of the pipeline because yeah. it, they are proactive now yeah, the, the, the idea is to make uh, security as frictionless and as easy for people to consume as possible, right? You start making security difficult to interact with. And I, when I say security, I'm talking tools and people and the mm -hmm. teams, right? You mm -hmm. make it difficult to interact with, people are going to find a way around you. And then that's going to open the company up to all kinds of risks. So, uh, you know, I, I do a fair amount of preaching to CISOs and, and security teams out there. It's like, you need to be a business partner and you need to be a business enabler. And here's some different ways that you can do that as we, as we kind of discussed already. Excellent. Thank you for sharing your insights, Clark and Glenn. I didn't happen to see any questions come through the chat. So that's going to be it for us. Again, a big thank you to our speakers, Clark and Glenn. If you'd like to get started with Clumio to help simplify data protection on AWS, you can get started yourself with a free trial at AWS Marketplace or request a call to learn more. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you on the next one.